But if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, where God has put Adam and Eve in the garden, you remember that God deals with this idea with the very first man, the very first couple. He puts them into paradise. He puts them in the garden of Eden. And in that garden, he puts the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he tells them, don't eat this tree. Don't eat the fruit from this tree. He gives them a choice. He gives them an actual choice. Now, there's been a lot of effort, uh, especially in the world of computers, to create artificial intelligence. So when you go on iTunes, if you buy a lot of music on iTunes, iTunes will start trying to predict what, what other music you would like. If you go on to Netflix and you order a bunch of movies from Netflix or you rate movies and you tell Netflix which movies you like, Netflix will start suggesting to you other movies that you would like. But all of those computer programs, and it gets far more advanced than that, but all those computer programs are reflections of an intelligent person writing the program and designing the program and learning from those that have gone before to make it better, to make these predictions. But we know that, obviously, because those computer programs could not exist without some intelligence designing them. But in the world of creation, our God, who is greater than the entire heavens and earth, created actual intelligence. And he created man in his own image and gave that man the ability to learn and to grow mentally and spiritually and then gave that man not only the ability but the authority to choose. Now you think about this. Evolution says there is no possibility of choice. Creation says that our creator is so great, he actually gave us the real ability to choose. You carry that one step further, it goes right back to where it did with the implications of a creator. He then has the right to judge your choices. And that's where they don't want to go. That's where people don't want to go. People are much more comfortable. People who don't want to give their life and live their life for a supreme being are much more comfortable with the idea that I can't even make real choices. Everything I choose was chosen for me. It's just a mirage that I get to make a choice. And I'll never have to answer for it. But that's false. It's obviously false. And the truth is that we can even reject God's purpose for us. Luke chapter 7, verse 30 it says, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose. God's purpose for Adam and Eve was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They rejected God's purpose and ate of that tree of knowledge. And then they experienced punishment. They experienced judgment. And we still are suffering the effects of their choice. Of course, we've made choices equally as bad as theirs, so it's not fair for us to sit in judgment of them, but it is fair for us to learn from their mistake and our mistakes and learn the reality of choice and the reality of judgment. Romans 1, verse 20, which Brady read a few minutes ago, says, For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. Notice this last phrase at the end of verse 20. So that they are without excuse. You see, evolution is the ultimate excuse. Evolution is the ultimate excuse. Whatever I do has been predetermined by my evolution, by my instincts, by these chemicals that have been held in my body and telling me what to do and actually controlling what I do so that I'm not actually answerable on any type of spiritual level for any of it. It's a huge excuse for bad behavior. God says, even if you don't know 
the Bible, even if you have not been taught the truth about God's revelation of his word, you can see the truth of God in creation. You can see the divinity of God in creation. You can see the eternal power of God in creation. And you have no excuse for rejecting the good and choosing the wrong. No excuse. That is an implication of creation. And it is a major reason that people will accept the absurd so that they can disbelieve the truth of creation. The third and final implication of creation that I want us to recognize is that if, if creation is true, if there is a God who has given us free will, then there is also something beyond physical life. Life does not end. Existence does not stop at physical death. If God exists and he created the world, then there is something beyond the physical world. And if there's something beyond the physical world, then we might experience something beyond the physical world. And you know what that means? That means there can be an everlasting repercussion for the choices that we make. And that is a frightening fact. But the implication of creation is that the physical world is not the extent of existence. And if the physical world is not the extent of existence, that this spiritual instinct that I have and that so many people want to hold at bay and want to reject and even deny its existence can have a powerful effect on me, not just for the 70 or 80 years that I may live here, but forever and ever and ever. Existence and perception can go on in spite of of physical death. Hebrews 9.27 says, Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. You see, if there is no creation, if it's all accidental natural process, and there is no God, then there is no possibility of ultimate justice. There is no possibility of an ultimate balancing of the scales. Once I die, it's over. And if it gets bad enough, I can end it right then. And once my physical life comes to an end, I can no longer be made to suffer for the wrong and the evil that I've committed. Hitler in his bunker shot himself, thinking probably that he wouldn't have to answer for what he had done. A lot of other people have done the same thing. But if creation is true, then there is a God, there's something greater than physical life. And you can be made to answer. And that's exactly what God says. After death, judgment. Back to Romans. We read pretty close to the end of Romans chapter 1, but if you come to Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, it's still in the same line of thought, still in the same line of argument about people rejecting God. Verse 5 of Romans chapter 2, Paul says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But, to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. With man, it's impossible to achieve perfect justice. With the finite capabilities of humanity, it's impossible to punish every wrongdoing, to reward every rightdoing. It's impossible for us to punish a person after his physical death. 
And so there's an escape route from human justice, not to mention the inherently limited and myopic nature of human justice. But if there is a creation, if there was a creation, then there is a creator who is transcendent across the heavens and the earth and all of existence. That creator who's powerful enough not only to create the heavens and the earth, not only to create morality, not only to create free will and free choice, he's also powerful enough to achieve ultimate justice. Perfect, complete justice. And not only is he powerful enough and able to do it, he's promised to do it. He's warned you. He's planning to do it. And to avoid that reality, to avoid the fact of a coming judgment, a reckoning, people will believe the ridiculous and say even though spontaneous generation has been proven impossible, we believe it occurred because we don't want to believe in ultimate justice. Those are the implications of creation. God exists, you're free to choose, and there will be an ultimate day of justice, an ultimate day of record. But simply and beautifully, divinely, God has provided remission. God has provided a substitution for you when you go before the judgment seat of Christ. God has provided a mechanism for a person to be subject to ultimate justice and still survive. Not only survive, but be rewarded with eternal life. That substitution is simply in the punishment of Christ. God, a member of the Godhead, took on human form, separated himself from his divinity, and lived on earth subject to the temptations the rigors, the disappointments, the heartbreaks of humanity. Lived a perfect life without sin and then sacrificed that life. Shed his blood, endured torture and murder for the purpose of balancing the scales. Took punishment that he didn't deserve so that we who do deserve it could avoid it. That is further proof of a divine creator. That he found a way to allow sinners to escape the punishment of their own sin and yet still allow that same sin to be punished and achieve ultimate justice. But that ultimate justice will only be transferred from you to Jesus if you're a member of his body. If you take advantage willingly and voluntarily of the sacrifice that he made. You can reject God's purpose for you, just like the Pharisees and the lawyers. You can reject the forgiveness and the substitution of Christ's sacrifice, and you can receive the due penalty of your sin if you choose. God has given you that power of choice. Choose Christ. Choose forgiveness. Choose salvation. And not punishment. If you haven't done so already, come to Christ today. Put your faith in Jesus. Confess that faith. Repent of your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you need to come to Christ, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.